This is Jane Sigford, convener of the podcast Views and Voice Above the Noise, hosted by MASA, Minnesota Association of School Administrators. Today's podcast is an interview with Dr. Neil Nickerson, professor at the University of Minnesota in the Department of Organizational Leadership, Policy, and Development. In other words, Dr. Nickerson teaches in the Educational Administration Program. We know that most superintendents come up through the ranks of being a teacher first, then assuming leadership positions, such as principal, curriculum specialist, special ed director, for example, and then they may continue their journey toward becoming a superintendent. Neil is one of the men who created the ed-ed programs at the university and is co-responsible for the high quality of administrators we have in Minnesota. The proposed licensure program was the first to be approved by the state of Minnesota. Subsequently, you will hear how other states wanted to know what was happening in Minnesota and how these professors shared their work, which was replicated by universities in South Dakota, North Dakota, Iowa, Wisconsin, Manitoba, to name a few. It's safe to call Neil Nickerson a founding father, even though His hair is shorter than that of our early founding fathers like George or Thomas or Benjamin. Besides, he has better taste in clothes. The originating professors at the university's program, like Neil, had all been school administrators themselves, so they designed and taught not only from a research base, but more importantly from practical experience. That has changed somewhat as courses are currently more often taught by researchers who invite practitioners in as speakers. Every few years, Neil and his peers would take a partial leave from the U and return to principal or superintendent positions to work in finance at the State Department of Education or to be a part of the legislative process to stay current in policymaking. You will hear about this later. Although he does have a superintendent's license, which he acknowledges with pride, he is largely taught in the principal courses because he recognizes that superintendents are often principals first. Superintendents need to support principals and principals need to support the superintendent. Both must recognize the value and differences in the two big jobs. He is also known throughout the state and across the nation for being instrumental in bringing underrepresented groups such as women and African American students into the program. He modified how and where he taught to meet the needs of his new types of learners. He coached, mentored and supported his candidates to walk them through the bureaucracy of a degree so that they completed the program. Without him, they would probably have dropped out. I can speak to that from personal experience. Without him, I would not have completed my doctorate. In this podcast, he will talk about how that focus occurred. What you will hear is the story of a man who believes in and practices the development of relationships across social groups. He supports and believes in people, especially students. As he says, that's why we're here. Neil demonstrates the power and necessity for a liberal arts background and the ways it can offer different paths to teaching and learning. He has taken speech classes, been a DJ in the Army, he could teach math and English, and he even entertains occasionally with his ukulele. He has developed nuggets of truth into short phrases that are applicable and memorable. One is delegate or die. You will hear more about that. However, in a note congratulating him for one of his many earned awards, a friend remarked on what an influence Neil has been, but he also reminded Neil that no one talked about what a dirty basketball player Neil is and was. Neil has had an impact on administrators in our state in two major ways. He was a founding father, if you will, in creating the programs in educational administration in the early 60s across our state and with our neighboring states and provinces. He and Van Mueller made an intentional drive to bring underrepresented groups such as women and African American students into the educational leadership programs and then they supported these students so they would be successful. His story is a living example of how one person can make a difference. Let's hear from Neil. Well, first of all, I graduated from high school, Carleton, Minnesota, where my mother had been a teacher there until my dad showed up after he graduated from the U and was a civil engineer and appointed county highway engineer, and they met and fell in love, so she couldn't teach anymore. 
That was when women were not allowed to take a job away from men, which is really dumb. I uh, went to McAllister for my undergrad. That was from 1946 to 1950. By the way, I decided to be a teacher when I started my senior year. My mother was always telling me I should do that. So I'm telling my students, always pay attention to your mother. That was fine. And my dad was angry because every generation of Nickerson men had gone to the U. Starting with my grandfather in 1889, and he played football for the Gophers at that time. And then my dad graduated from the U in 1918, and right in the end of the war, he didn't uh, disinherit me because I didn't go to the U, because I went to a McAllister, a Presbyterian college. When I graduated McAllister, I wanted to teach at South St. Paul High School. The superintendent at that time was a guy named Simley, who ultimately helped build Simley High School here. Okay, and then he said, well, what's your draft status? I was 1A. He said, I'm sorry, we can't take you, because I would be wounded and never come back, I guess, or killed. However, I was really down, and I was looking at a job in Alaska. I went home, and my mother said that Mr. Stolen had called, wondered if you had a job yet. And he said, there's a math open at West Junior High. Okay. So I took it, taught seven weeks, and was drafted. I said, I know Mr. Stolen, I have to tell you that I, I'm 1A. He said, we don't care. You'll go and you'll come back. I got tenure in the school while I was in the Army because that was the law. At my master's at UMD, they had one class in Ed Ad, and it was taught by a guy who had never been a school administrator. So my master's is in curriculum and instruction. That was fine. But the law said at that time, if you have a master's in education, you can be a principal of any school. Prior to that, they were licensed by size of school. If you had one class, you could be be that principal in Renshaw, Minnesota, or Carleton, but I had a master's, so. 1957, I went from West Junior High to Columbia University, a teacher's college, to get my doctorate in education administration. And my advisor was the guy who had written the best book on the principalship, Dave Austin. And my dissertation dealt with relationships between total staff and quality of the kids' achievement. When I graduated from Columbia in the spring of 64, I'd been there from 62 to 64, two years there, with a wife, a mother-in-law, and a U-Haul trailer. We didn't have a dog, though. We enjoyed New York City. That was fun. I wasn't at my own graduation because City College in New York, which is close to, it's in Harlem, close to Columbia, was wanted to start an ed ad program, and they hired me to come down and see if I could talk to people to start an administrative internship program, which we did here. So I did that. I couldn't go to my graduation because I was finishing up a semester there. Donna went to the graduate. She said it was very nice. Then I was hired at the U on my way for, to a job interview at University of Nebraska, Lincoln. That was a time when a lot of people were suddenly realizing that ed ad is pretty important. So I had a job offer from Dartmouth. Couldn't afford to live up there, but... And from Toledo. University of Toledo paid better than either Lincoln or Minnesota. Lincoln and Minnesota offered $8,000 for the academic year. Then you're expected to teach summer school. Toledo offered $10,000. So the only reason I was going to go there was because they taught better. This was the spring of 1964. They had my resume, and they wanted somebody who had been a principal, to an administrator to do that. And uh, Nebraska had a good reputation. At least they had a good football team then. Getting his job at the university was the beginning of an ed-ad program, a friendship and professional cadre of strong professors, later they called themselves the Cockroach Seven, and Neil can't remember where that name came from, and the development of strong administrative leaders in our state. You will hear the names of these influential men, Cliff Hooker, Van Mueller, Chuck Cedarberg, 
Tim Mazzoni, Vern Hendricks, Gary Alkire, William Ammentorp, and others. A core group of these men worked together for over 30 years. What they accomplished is truly remarkable. Cliff Hooker was the chair. He taught school law. I started that summer, and my first teaching was administrative theory, and I was terrible at it. That was the worst class I ever had in. And they had a curriculum for it, and somebody had done it, and I worked at it. But the graduate students were very kind, so I got through that. That's not my field. I don't deal in theory well at all. But anyway, Hooker laughed. I laughed. And then Van came at the end of that summer, and he taught finance. Chuck Cedarberg came, and he taught school budgeting. Tim Mazzoni came and taught politics. We had a powerful group until they died. Van had cancer, and he had to come in to go to hospice, so he had to retire. And Tim was so enthused about research, and was so good at research, and he was really good at it in politics. He'd go down and spend days with the, the legislature. Remember, he always talked over a class's head. And we had a lunch one time. Well, his name came up, and he, he said he always wore the same clothes. And then we had uh, a couple others. What Hendricks came from Texas, and he taught statistics. Gary Alkire came from Michigan State, and he was teaching elementary principalship. He'd been a principal in Michigan. By the way, at that time, University of Minnesota in Ed Ad in the College of Ed was not hiring its own grads because they had so all of them they had there. Hooker was from Pittsburgh, but everybody else was from the U, Cedarburg and two or three others, I you know. And so when I came, I was from Columbia University, so I got hired. If I'd been from Minnesota, I wouldn't have. And the next three guys that came, Van, Gary, and Dick Weatherman. I knew Dick Weatherman from Duluth. He was director of special ed. They all got their doctorates at Michigan State. Amator came from University of Chicago. Hendricks came from Texas. Mazzoni came from part of the University of California. I can't remember which one now. A side benefit of the close working relationship of these men, they started socializing and playing poker and they called themselves the Cockroach Seven. Neil can't remember where the name came from, but he does remember that they'd get together, smoke cigars, drink beer, have sandwiches, and have a few laughs together. Well, there was, we played in Hooker's Basement, so that's one. Smoking cigars, you said. It was Dick Weatherman, Van Mueller, Tim Mazzoni, me. We had a guy from, I can't think of his name now, he was working with the interactive community stuff for our department. And on occasion, there was a Native American guy who worked at the State Department. Can't think of his name either. He came. And he taught us some Indian games. It's called Screw the White Man. So that was the seven. Now, we didn't all be there at the time. On occasion, somebody would come. And Mazzoni would come, and we all played nickel dime quarter for years. How can, you really got to work hard, but somebody brought the beer, somebody brought the food. Hooker's second wife liked to have us there. She didn't like it. We called it the Cockroach Seven, but anyway, that was fun. Mazzoni was very impatient about everything, so when he lost his twenty dollars, he left. He left. He wouldn't stick around for beer and sandwiches. And Dick Weatherman had a really uh, interesting philosophy in poker. He'd wait and wait and wait and wait until he had a really good hand. And then he'd, he'd bet. Well, we learned that, so we didn't bet much <laughs> against him. Each of us had idiosyncrasies. But. Several things happened at the university beginning in 1964 to create a perfect storm of a strong ed-ad program with strong professors. I asked Neil what the program was like in those early days. Growing. When Bob Keller became dean and Cliff Hooker was our department chair, they had to grow the ed ad department. We were the ed ad department per se when I came, and it wasn't until about seven years later we adopted philosophical foundations and then we divided. 
up to personnel and other things. So now, when the state changed the license for administrators, principals and superintendents from a master's degree, and it went to a master's plus plus 30 credits, 60 credits, post-baccalaureate, and within that you would have 21 credits of ed ad. And Hooker said, asked me to set up our program to do that, so I did. Ours was the first one that was approved by the state, and we were just, you would laugh. It was all paper, but people would come with boxes of paper to show all the competencies were fine. The 21, we changed them a little bit, but of course was the superintendency, and it was the finance one, and there got to have been a political one in there too. Now maybe Mazzoni took or both of those, but I know Law Hooker took, and Van took the financing for the superintendents. But Hooker took a semester off and worked on the State Department with the Finance Department. And Van took a semester off and worked on there too to learn about all this stuff. However, the, the Ed Ed License Program is still going very strong and we've added another facilitator. Nadia Parker was the first and, and Randy Zip the first two facilitators when we set this up. They were both students of mine. And uh, then I was there working a lot of it. North Dakota, South Dakota, Iowa, Wisconsin, and Manitoba were interested in the state law change for licensing. And they asked us about it. A bunch of us, MASSP said, uh, Dave Mead was the director at that time. He and I went out and uh, help North Dakota U get what the Minnesota requirement took, which was better than anything North Dakota had. And they were approved by Minnesota, not for the superintendency, but for the principalship. North Dakota State did the same thing. South Dakota State, University of South Dakota, Northern Iowa, University of Manitoba, Wisconsin River Falls, Iowa State. We never got the big Madison or big uh, Iowa in. So we helped them all, and, and that was great. I wondered what made the U's program so good. Was it the synergy of these talented men? Sheer luck? Neil's response, as is typical of him, practiced what Jim Collins in his book, Good to Great, described as level five leadership. A level five leader is one who takes an organization from good to great and therefore must have personal humility and professional will. One of the descriptors of a level five leader is that it is someone who uses the mirror window practice. If something does not go well within the organization, a level five leader looks in the mirror to apportion responsibility, but not to blame. When success occurs instead of the mirror, a level five leader looks through a window to apportion credit for that success. This practice of a leader was evident in Neil's answer. The requirement at both Minnesota and Nebraska were you must have a license and been experienced as a school administrator, period. Had it never been before, and we all were. Van was a superintendent in Michigan. Gary was a principal. I was a principal. Weatherman was a director of special ed. Mazzoni was an assistant principal. Uh, Hendricks was, I guess, a statistician. I don't know if he ever had any building experience. Rather than claiming that these men were exceptional individuals, and as a team they were even more amazing in what they accomplished, Neil ascribed the success of the program to a change in university requirements that professors had to have administrative experience in order to teach in the program. Currently, many courses are taught by researchers. I asked Neil about that. Researchers are supposed to share their research with practitioners, okay? Nicola Alexander, who is with us now, and she actually took Van's place in teaching school finance. She teaches the big philosophy of seminar and talks good stuff. Then we found out that, for instance, she was teaching school finance. And she would ask me to come in and talk about what our principal's doing. I don't know if she did that with a superintendent or not. But I don't think she did because when our licensed people taking a superintendent, 
every professor, adjunct professor who was teaching that was a retired superintendent. Neil was never a superintendent. The closest he came was when he worked for St. Paul to create their Principal's Academy. I asked him why he concentrated on the principalship and never applied for a superintendency. Because I was a principal and I got in a lot of trouble with superintendents, except for <laughs> Stolen, who I never asked him for anything. I wanted to be with the kids. I'm very closer than that. And superintendents have a board of 14 people. That's what it was in Duluth at one time. So you've got 14, no, it's maybe six. You have no, no tenure. Principals, we had tenure. We had to deal with superintendents and boards because they are responsible. So my, my real focus was, is the relationship with everybody, each of the parents, etc. The PTA at West was really non-existent, but we took care of that too. So. Neil recognized that superintendents have many bosses because of the school board instead of just one like the principals have. He had said that he'd gotten in trouble with superintendents because he, more than once, lied to the superintendent in order to get things to happen for kids. The morning we were leaving, I called the superintendent and said, I suppose you heard we're going to Chicago for the band. He says, oh, did you tell me that? I said, oh, sure, I sent you a memo or something. I didn't. He said, okay, good luck. The responsibilities of a superintendent are different than those of a principal. Neil loved the principalship because of the interaction with students and staff. Yet for some people, the role of superintendent fits their skill set. Neil appreciates the differences in job descriptions and recognizes the need for both types of individuals. They had to follow policy, and I, I, I wanted to follow what's best for kids and teachers. And they had policy, and I had to follow policy. And some of the policy was goofy. See, the board had negotiated with the teacher union in Duluth, and when I was teaching there at West, I was a member of the union. But then when we got to West, we were doing, we went to a seven period day. The bus schedule, they didn't have many buses, but they were special ed buses, so don't screw with the bus schedule. We found that, so we didn't. So the faculty and I, when we were going to go from six periods to seven periods, we didn't ask permission for that either, because the state law says you have to have so many periods and so many minutes. And they said, well, well let's do that. So we had a short, shortened sum and some periods. And the union found out about that and they filed an unfair labor practice against me because the teachers did at last one minute of the lunch period. We decided that we had the uh, passing time between the lunches at classes by one minute. We didn't, but that was would survive then. Some of Neil's attitudes toward policy and doing what's best for kids led to his creation of the four axioms that he taught in his principalship class. These axioms are also an example of Neil Nickerson's teaching style that was also a change from past practice. He was never a lecturer where students took notes. His style was more like that of a bard. He told stories and used many real-life examples to make his points. He used the experiences of students to problem-solve and incite interaction and dialogue in the class. He used case studies of real experiences so that the discussions were not hypothetical or simple. He sometimes even started singing in the class on occasion, which got everyone smiling. Upon reflection, these strategies are more sensitive to the learning styles of women and people of color, the very types of students Neil was trying to support and help navigate the bureaucratic higher ed system. Interestingly, this style of instruction and learning is more conducive to the style of leadership that is necessary in today's organizations. Collaboration, multiple styles of input, interactive dialogue, and personal involvement in the content are all recognized as effective ways for learners to learn whether they are 6 or 60. Case studies illustrating the four axioms would be an engaging curriculum by themselves for a current principal or superintendent course. Here they are. Enjoy. So first what is what it don't do nothing but when you get the, there's a correlator but when you get the information you got to move fast. 
to do it right, but don't move it until you got all the data you need. Think of the kids. The thing I had on my door, how will this decision affect the, the students? I had it on my door for years. The second one was that every they remember, delegate or die. That's that's an easy one. The problem with that is, as you know, to whom do you have you can delegate? At West Junior High, we had one guidance counselor, Dick Green, and he was a great guy. But we had 900 kids. Anyway, I found other people. That has something to do with Rule 3, which was deceit and slight cutting, but you can't teach that. So now it's called creative insubordination. That's what they're bad terms. Deceitful is not good, and sly cunning is not good. You can't advertise that. I'm going to be deceitful, and I'm going to be sly and do well. Creative insubordination, I was thinking of superintendents going the bus to Chicago, <laughs> starting some other things, starting a seven-period day. Nobody, none of the other junior highs did that. And when I was first one, when I was at, at uh, Oakland in uh, Stillwater, the seventh grade faculty was go-getters, and we put them on a seven-period day, and everybody else was on a six-period day. I never asked the superintendent about that either. If they don't work, you have to sweat. The point is, Dave Austin, my mentor, who'd been in schools a lot, and he said, you know, the first year is the dangerous year. I hope you don't have a family. Well, I had a family, and, and one kid anyway. The closest my wife ever came to divorcing me was that first year at West. I was putting in 80-hour weeks. So it took me so long to find out what worked there and, and who I could trust. In case you didn't catch the four axioms, here they are. One, when in doubt, do nothing. The corollary is... But when you get the necessary information, act quickly. Two, delegate or die. The difficulty is having the right people to delegate to. Three, use creative insubordination. This used to be deceit or sly cunning, which Neil says is no longer teachable because deceit and sly cunning are not good attributes. Four, if they don't work, you have to. We've heard about the past, and now I wonder what Neil sees as the difference in the needs for future leaders. Decision-making is slowed down because it's really necessary to share decision-making with the people who are going to be affected by it. So that's like delegate or die. And uh, the decisions, I think, are okay. However, the policy and the school boards and the state legislature are, are not focusing on the kids. And we could talk forever. The climate, the cult culture is different. I shouldn't say climate. The culture is different. The percentage of non-Caucasian kids now was shaking a lot of people up. Look at Minneapolis and St. Paul, Minneapolis particularly. And how are they going to handle the finance necessary, et cetera, et cetera. So if I were to rewrite that article that I wrote, Five Things to Do to Change the School Around, the one thing, I, no, two things I would change. I wrote it when it was all men. I'd have to change that. And I apologize for that. Anyway, my mother would have killed me. And the other one is the culture is changed. There's an article in the paper this morning someplace, St. Paul. Uh, the Caucasians are in the minority now. So what type of people do we need as future leaders? Hopefully, whoever's going to be a superintendent has to have been a principal. That was the case in Wisconsin. And secondly, you have to be patient. Relationships are more important, and it's harder because there are more people that are interested in schools. We're all interested in the kids. At an award ceremony, the President's Award for Outstanding Service, which recognizes faculty and staff who have provided exceptional service to the university, on June of 2013, Neil's engagement with students was acknowledged because the informational blurb on the program said that Neil had served as advisor or co-advisor for more than 242 students and as a committee member for more than 720 students. At that time, six doctoral students were working with him to complete their degrees. Well, that was five years ago, and Neil is still going. 
It is acknowledged and recognized in this state and across the nation that Neil has made a dedicated effort to bring women and students of color on board to the administrative licensure and doctoral programs in educational administration. How and why did he do this? I am a lucky recipient of his intentions and efforts. When examining what he did differently, I have compiled an observational list that just hints at all the things Neil did. First, he established his overriding goal as one to support and mentor women and people of color. A few of the actions that moved that goal forward are, first, he had a driving focus. Second, he had a belief and practice of developing strong relationships. He would teach classes in differing places, not necessarily on campus, in order to meet the geographic challenges for some. He would teach at times that were more conducive to teacher schedules, for example, teach on Saturday morning or not Friday night. He would break processes into small, accomplishable bits so the task did not seem insurmountable. He used case studies and practical experiences as teaching tools, not just using a textbook. He would go to the student's workplace for meetings to make it more accessible to the student. He used the beauty of humor to make learning approachable. Plus, it was fun. This is only a small list designed only by me, but I would be interested to hear from others as to what they would add. My email is jlsigfert at comcast.net if you have something you would like to share with me, and I would love to hear from you. Here is Neil's story about this wonderful effort. Van and I talked about that. You know, we were neighbors. He was one of the Cockroach Seven, and we were just talking about the lack of good administrators. And we realized there is half our population is being ignored. And we started changing people with scolia. You have to be an old white guy to change one of those intervals. And we succeeded with scolia. And then we also did that with Fido da Capa. That was only for men. Raise a little hell, and I think Joyce Jackson was the first woman to belong to Scolia. So we did stuff like that. Van really was working with the PTA. He got to be a big number in the national PTA. That was good. So we had that whole audience. When people were discouraged and threatening to quit, you didn't let them, and somehow you got them to move forward. How was that? That's because I'm half Norwegian and half Scotch. And think of all much, how much money you spent that far and got frustrated and probably going to quit. I, anyway, I am cheap, so I said, how much is the tuition? How much have you paid? And you're going to quit now? And, and all you have left is a dissertation? You have to pay credits for that? Sure. But you've lost how many... $60,000 already that you paid? Oh, well, how am I going to pick that up? Come see me. And it's not that complicated when you've got relationships with this person, not as a peon. The first time I got my attention, there were 12 women school administrators in the public schools in Minnesota. Most of them were county superintendents. There were a few principals. But then Van and I got thinking about that. Wait a minute. Oh, why is that? Research says women are stronger than men anyway. My wife always said, we're smarter than you are too. So she was uh, the exception. She married me. You look at your clientele. An example, what, one of the things I did. When I was teaching the principalship course, I don't know when it was, the 70s, maybe the 80s. And the, the principal at Minneapolis... Central was a friend of mine. But I said, what if I brought my class and taught it in your school on whatever night it was? Fine. So I told the class, we're going to meet at Minneapolis Central next time. Two of them dropped out, two whites. But they didn't the, want to go to Central. That never came up. I, that's what I think. The class went fine. And I've done that before. I've taken it out to the zoo school and taught people there. I taught uh, Ann Hennessy, who was a great middle school principal in Columbia Heights. I took my class. That was a Saturday morning class. I took them out there. 
and I then often had classes on Saturday morning rather than Friday night. Friday night is the worst night for a teacher, and you can come and have a lecture on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And I don't think so. So it took some doing, but most of my classes then, towards the end, the principalship anyway, and actually I took over both elementary and secondary when Alcar was. Berndia Johnson, who was superintendent, wrote her dissertation on black women superintendents. Really interesting. She lasted only three years in Minneapolis. She's now a professor at Mankato State. And she wrote a really nice editorial in the Minneapolis Tribune the other day about looking at kids and teachers and places uh, individually. She she likes the relationship stuff. Maybe she got it from me. But. Your love for the principalship is obvious. We know that most who become superintendents are often principals first. Yet we know that the superintendency is seen as more prestigious and as the highest achievement in the organizational hierarchy of schools. Why is that? It pays more. The people that get a superintendent's license now with us want to be assistant superintendents, not superintendents. Director of curriculum, director of special ed, or whatever, basic curriculum. You only have one boss then. It's the superintendent. Neil's gift to all of us is his longevity of service and his involvement in multiple layers of education, from practitioner to researcher, his love for people, his dedication to education, kids and teachers, his humanity, as shown in his humor. His perspective is vital and helpful to all of us. His comments that people are working towards superintendent licensure now are looking to be assistant superintendents reflects, I believe, the recognition that the job of superintendent, and principal too for that matter, are more complicated, political, intense, and difficult. Because of that, the need for emotional and professional support for practitioners is even more pronounced, which MASA recognizes by providing multiple avenues of interaction, this podcast being only one of many. If you have other ideas, please email the association at members at mnasa.org. In addition, Neil and I are going to be writing a book to tell his story and to tell stories about him. If you have an anecdote or an experience or accomplishment or just a funny story about him that you'd like to share with others, please email me at jlsigford at comcast.net. Neil has so many unique words of wisdom that I will use some of his rather than the wise words from my favorite philosopher, Dr. Seuss, who I believe is now on sabbatical. He went back to the real world to get more experience. I think he's following Neil's example. Here are Neil's wise words. Take advantage of your contacts. This is Jane Sigford signing off. Thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.